7 today as we continue to step through the book of Romans. Y'all do remember next Sunday is Pastor Appreciation Sunday. We'll be having a luncheon afterwards. Y'all please stay around with us. No services next Sunday night. And uh, they, they give you that time off. So they say that they're giving me a break, but I know what it is. They're giving y'all a break. And so the, uh, I, was, <laughs> I, <tried. laughs> I was joking with a, another pastor and he was talking about having to, uh, he was going to take a weekend and he was going to plan out the rest of his sermons for, uh, for the rest of the year. I told him, so that's easy when you preach 20 minutes at a time. I said, you know, I, said, I preach three hours a week. And, and I said, you know, I'd have to take a year off to plan for the end of the year. But the, uh, we're going to uh, Romans chapter 7. We're going to be in verse 1. He says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law? For the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For... For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she's released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law. So that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit, not in the oldness of the letter." What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore the law was holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me, though what is good, through what is good. So that sin, through the commandment, might be come exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law was spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. For what, am I, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that sin in me, that is, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into the captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members." O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Let us pray.
Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for loving us and for blessing us, Father, for this time together in your house with you. And Father, we pray that during this time that your spirit would dwell heavily among us, Father, that it would interpret this word to us, that we can understand it, that we can apply it to our lives, Father, that we can be more like your son, Jesus, every day, that we can shine your light into those dark places in which you've placed us, Father, this sin-sick world in which we find ourselves. Father, in all things, we seek to glorify your name, to grow your kingdom, Father, to honor your name. We ask all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So far in the book of Romans, what we've seen is that Paul is addressing a lot of uh, kind of controversial topics at the time where there was kind of a schism, a bit of a divide among the church, among those who were raised as Jew, uh, you know, as Orthodox Jews, who then later saw Christ as the Messiah and became what we call today Messianic Jews or Christians, those who were Gentiles, who now name the name of Christ and who have come into the faith, and that these two opposite groups are now uh, no longer at odds against one another, but now are serving the one same God. And so there's kind of this schism between the two, where the uh, Jews very often wanted the Gentiles to become much more Jewish. And then the Gentiles were resistant towards that. They didn't want to become orthodox in all of those ways. They didn't want to become Jewish. They were seeing themselves as Christians. And so there was this warring faction between the two of how far do we go, how much is there. And, and a lot of times those who had been born and raised in Judaism had a uh, kind of a superiority complex about themselves. They kind of looked down upon the lowly Gentiles. They were out there praying to these foreign gods, caught up in all kinds of mythology. Here they had the one true God. They had a heritage. They had a family background. They had all of these things working for them that they were simply more knowledgeable about the things of God. They had a culture which generationally had produced uh, you know, the ways of God in their life. They were just used to it. They were born and bred into it. They were raised in it. And so they were kind of accustomed to it and thought themselves higher than the Gentiles. Paul, in the book of Romans, very much addresses this issue. In fact, it's kind of the one running theme throughout the book of that uh, the Jews should actually be ashamed of what they're proud of. And because they were proud of their last name, their heritage, their upbringing, their, their, uh, their schooling, their education, their culture, their background, all of these traditions, they were proud of all of that. And Paul spends the first five chapters basically saying, you had a head start and you still missed out. You had a head start and you were still sinful. You had a head start and you only reached this far. You ought not to be proud of that. And he goes through the heroes of the faith and he addresses Abraham, he addresses Adam, he addresses David, and points out that these men were felled men. These men were not perfect. These men were not ones to necessarily be so proud of. To be proud of, yes, but not be so proud of. And he lays out the case that all are lost. The Jew was lost just the same as the Gentile was lost. That the Jew needed justification just the same as the Gentile needed justification. And in chapter 6, he began to tell us that not only did the Jew need justification, not only did the Gentile need justification, but they also both needed sanctification. Neither were complete works yet. Their sin debt had been forgiven of both, but in that they still had a lot of growing and a lot of maturing and a lot of uh, coming around to do in order to obtain what God had called them to be, that they were all failing in their endeavors to be all that God had called them to be. Today, we are still failing in the endeavors to be all that God has called us to be, that we are pursuing that perfection, but we're not obtaining it. And that every day that we press further towards the things of God, we try to leave sin further behind us, we repent every day, but in that, that we always are finding new sin to repent of. We're engaged in the process of sanctification. 
Now Paul, being raised as a Pharisee, having this grand education and schooling, this indoctrination into the camp of the Pharisees, and their love of the letter of the law had led them to make many more commandments that were the commandments of men than God ever gave them. God gave them a few hundred commands to keep. The Pharisees then added on several hundred more commandments to keep in order to keep from breaking one of the commandments of God. And so if the speed limit was 55, the Pharisees said, set your speedometer at 54, just to keep from going 55 and then possibly going 56 and breaking the command of God. They had rules in place to keep you from breaking rules that were in place to keep you from breaking the law of God. They went much further than God, but then they also set up those roadblocks, but they worshiped the roadblocks more than they worshiped the law of God. Their preferences, their words, their traditions, their heritage began to take on a religion of its own to the place that they had perverted the law to be something that it was never meant to be. Paul, seeing this and knowing the objections of the people that he writes to, begins to answer some of these objections surrounding the law in chapter 7. He starts out and he, he gives us, in verses 1 through 6, he gives us this beginning treatise and he talks about that uh, we're under the law as long as we're the lawgiver is alive, as long as that is there. And he used this portrait of a wife married to a husband. And that as long as the wife is married to the husband, she kind of does things the way that the husband says to do them. That there's this culture within the family, there's this dynamic between husband and wife where she learns his preferences, she learns his ways, she learns what his favorite meals are, she learns how to please him in different ways, and so she carries about her life in that way to please her husband. But once the husband is passed on, She's free to remarry. And when she remarries, guess what? There's a new husband. There's a new way. There's a new person to learn. There's a new way of doing things. If we carried the old preferences into the new covenant, then in that we would find that we're doing things that actually don't please the one that we're trying to please. We're carrying on in such a way. Husband number one might have loved meatloaf. Husband number two detests it. If you're cooking meatloaf five uh, nights a week, guess what? You're not serving the new husband. You're serving one who has gone on, one who has passed away, or one who has filed for divorce. And so in that, we can't please in one covenant the one that we're no longer covenanted with. And so in that, he's, he's pushing us towards this idea to understand that the law at one point was a, had a marriage-ish type relationship. There was a covenant within that law that the Jews subscribed to. But now that they had been redeemed from that, the law by death, death died. And so therefore, the sting was taken away from the law. And in that, now they were able to push forward into a new covenant with, with God himself. That they were freed from Moses and now we're grafted into Abraham. And that Abraham comes along and guess what? Abraham was before the law. And so in that, we don't have to keep the law for any justification. We don't have to keep the law in order for our salvation. But now we predate the law in our relationship with God, and we're grafted into the faith of Abraham, who is justified by his willingness to hear God and obey God. So the letter and the, the jot and the tittle doesn't apply to us for our justification, but now it serves an entirely different purpose. Now that purpose is as a tutor, as a babysitter, that it was to show us what sin was to keep us from committing it as much as possible in order to keep sin debt down. Never to pay it off, but just simply to keep it suppressed, to keep it low, to keep it uh, manageable so it doesn't run rampant and spread out of, uh, out, uh, you know, out of bounds. 
And so in that, now we have died towards the law so that we could bear fruit towards God. Now, this is the point where a lot of people really get mixed up. And this is the point where people really tend to get things out of whack. Because there's one of two things that typically happens within the Christian church when you start to deal with the law of God. And it's two polar opposites, it's two extremes. One extreme is those who push away from the law and say that that absolutely has nothing to do with us. We, we don't have anything to do with the law of God. We're not under the law, we're under grace. And so therefore, any attempt to obey the law of God whatsoever is an affront to Christianity. And so we don't obey the law, we don't recognize it, we don't study it, we don't do anything to do with the law. Just close the book, tear out those, those chapters, and just move along. Then there's the other side. And the other side, uh, once they experience the grace of God, once they see, uh, once they feel that, that justification, they enter into sanctification, what their process very often is, is that they say, okay, what's next? And many churches fail to provide the discipleship of what is next. Many pulpits uh, fail to preach and teach the requirements or the expectations that God has upon the Christian believer. And so it leaves the believer themselves looking for something more. And what their tendency is, is to press further into those things that they're freed from just to try to find some identity, some next step, some process of what they should be, where they should be heading, what they should be doing with their life. And they can become legalistic. And they can even go as far as to go into the Old Testament and they want to begin to wear the, the head coverings. They want to begin to obey the Levitical food laws. They want to begin to do all of these things which are passed away because they don't understand the relationship with the law either. So one group says, if it feels good, do it. And they become very carnal. They become very Hellenistic in their relationship with Christianity. And the other ones say there has to be something more, so let's revert to a previous gone by years, and let's start to obey things that were in Judaism, even though they're not mandated in Christianity. Both of these are wrong. Both of these are wrong. The law of God contain, is contained in three separate sections, three divisions. Those three divisions is a civic law, which is set up for government, uh, tells them you know, how to arrange their government, their courts, all of these various things. And guess what? We, we don't do that. Now, why don't we do that? Well, it's because we don't live in a theocracy. We live in a different country. And so as Christianity spread and as it went into various lands and different cultures and different people groups, it wouldn't be an expectation of the believers to have to convert those secular governments or to have to push away from those secular governments in order to obey God. So therefore, it's not a theocracy. It's not Israel. We don't live in Jerusalem. And so therefore, the civil law does not apply to Christians. Now, if we had an entirely Christian nation, if all of us were Christians and we were, uh, you know, the vast majority of America was Christian, should we set up uh, a, a government that lines itself up with the ways of God? Absolutely, we should. If we find ourselves there, absolutely, we should. But the reality is, is that as Christianity spreads across the world, the civil law doesn't apply to them. Then there's the sacrificial laws. And boy, there's a bunch of sacrificial laws. And so there were a lot of barbecues. There was a lot of, uh, lot of uh, sheep being slaughtered. There was a lot of turtle doves and oxen and all of these various sacrifices that were put upon the altar for different purposes and for different reasons to make an atonement for sin or looking for God's hand of blessing going forward. Well, the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus was our final sacrifice and that also Jesus was our final altar. We have no more altar in Christianity and we have no more need for a sacrifice in Christianity. And so one doesn't apply. The second sacrificial, it was fulfilled. 
Jesus fulfilled all of the requirement of all of the sacrifices. And so therefore, for us to then offer up sacrifices for blood atonement would be to degrade what Christ had already done. It would be an abomination of desolation for us to say that the blood of Christ is not enough. We need the blood of a lamb. And so therefore, that doesn't apply to us any longer. Christ fulfilled the sacrificial law. The third realm is what we call the moral law, the moral law. And in there contains the Ten Commandments and several others that we find great wisdom that apply to the moral law. So who among us as Christians thinks that it's okay for a Christian to murder, to take innocent life? Well, nobody believes that. Well, I thought the law was done away with. We're not under the law. We're under grace. No, we all still believe that murder is a sin. Well, stealing is a sin too, isn't it? Nobody is pro-stealing in the Christian camp. Absolutely not. How many of us are pro-covetousness? Well, before you check your social media, let's all agree that we're anti-covetousness. Before we listen to the advertisements, before we watch the commercials on television, let's agree that we're anti-coveting what somebody else has. How many Christians are pro-adultery? Yeah, none are pro-adultery. None whatsoever. So we still, within the convictions of our own heart, we know that the moral law still applies to us as Christians. It still identifies sin. It also identifies the righteousness of God. It shows us what God requires, what God ordains, what God says is right and holy. And then it reveals our inability to keep that. And so there's this disparity, there's this gap, there's this sin between what we're able to keep, what we're willing to keep, and what God requires of us to keep, of the perfection and the holiness of God and our own righteousness down here. There's a great disparity. And so in that, the law for the Christian, it no longer condemns us because there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. But the law absolutely convicts us of our sin and shows us what's right, shows us what's wrong, and urges us or or goads us towards what is right and what is good and what is holy. In fact, that's the whole second section of chapter chapter 7. It runs from verse 7 to verse 12, and it asks the question, Is the law sin? He says, absolutely not. I wouldn't have known sin if it's not from the law. And he concludes that in verse 12 as he says, Therefore, the law is holy. The law is holy. Don't you dare call what God called holy unnecessary or irrelevant or that it no longer applies. It is holy and it is just. And it is good. The law for your life is holy. It's separated. It separates you from the rest of this lost world. It separates you unto the things of God. It is just. It is right. It is pure. It is untainted and unchanging by the corrupt morals of this world. It doesn't matter if we're in the year, uh, if we're in the year 40. Or if we're in the year 2020, the law of God is still the law of God. And it is still just, and it is pure, and it is holy, and it applies, and it is relevant, and it shows us because it is separate from us. It is just, and it's good. It's a blessing. When we begin to obey the law of God, when we look into its deeper meanings and we apply those to our lives, your life will become more and more good. As you become more and more just. And as you become more and more holy in our obedience to God. He says, what then, what good... What good become death to me, what is good has become death to me, certainly not. 
but sin, that it might appear sin, was producing in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. Wow. He says the law made sin exceedingly sinful. That sin used the law to make me exceedingly sinful. Now, how is that possible? How does that manifest itself? How does that work itself out in our lives? How does sin make the law become exceedingly sinful to us? Well, it's easy. If you don't know that something's wrong and you do it, what is that? That's a mistake, right? Well, I didn't know any better. I didn't know I couldn't do that. But once somebody comes along and clearly defines for you that you cannot do that, then now you're transgressing into that, your disobedience against the knowledge that it was right or the knowledge that it was wrong now becomes exceedingly sinful because you can't plead ignorance. You weren't ignorant. You were rebellious. You chose disobedience. You didn't just obey, disobey, you willfully disobeyed. You said, I know it's wrong, I don't care, I'm going to do it anyways. Now it's exceedingly sinful, because now you know better. Each and every one of us in here today, we know better. We've been taught, we've been trained, we've had the holy book in our lives, in our, in our living rooms, in our bedrooms, we've carried it with us to church, we've had it in Sunday school, we've been taught, we have every opportunity to know what is right and what God requires of us, and so therefore, when we sin, it's exceedingly sinful. It ain't that you don't know no better, it's that you don't care, it's that you've chosen yourself over God and that you've made yourself the God of your own life. You've chosen that sin over the commandments of God and now it's exceedingly sinful for you to do such because you know that Christ died for you. You know that the Holy Spirit pricks and convicts your heart when you engage in those sinful activities. When you're doing what you're not supposed to do in the eyes of God, the Holy Spirit convicts you. And the words of God echo in your memory so that you are without excuse. You can't say, I didn't know. You can't say, I didn't know. You had every opportunity. It's like driving down the highway and every time there's a speed limit sign, you close your eyes. As you drive past it. And then you get pulled over and, and the police officer says, do you know how fast you were going? You say, no, I don't. I wasn't looking at my speedometer. I said, well, you know what the speed limit was? He said, no, I didn't see it. I closed my eyes every time I passed one. He would say, sir, you're dumb. You need to just, you need to hand in your keys. You need to give up driving. You need to call the cat's bus. You need somebody to chauffeur you around. Because you're not capable of this. In the same way, for us to have the Word of God, to have the words that are written there clearly and plainly for us, to have thousands of years of biblical teaching at our fingertips while we're scrolling through Instagram, while we're scrolling through Facebook, while we're TikToking, while we're uh, uh, Pinteresting, while we're doing everything else, and there the words of God and all of the biblical teaching that's accessible to us today through the, through the gift of the internet that God gave us, and we use it for unholy purposes and then say, well, I had my eyes closed, I don't know, I don't know what God said. I didn't see the signs. We're without excuse. It's not that we don't know. It's that we don't care to know. And we need to quit lying to ourselves and quit deceiving ourselves that somehow it's okay for us to be ignorant of the things that God has clearly taught us and trained us and given us as a design for us to live by. We're without excuse. So often what we'll do is when we're confronted with the law of God, we'll have this, this attitude of, of that now that we know what God requires and we know what the righteous requirement of God is, 
And what we'll do is we'll take our sinful heart towards the law of God. And so the question now where God has set us free from the curse of the law, that we no longer have to worry about our justification, and now we're engaged in the process of sanctification where we can pursue God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, that we can try to do what is right and holy and best in every situation without fear of failure. Because if we're trying to do good, if we're truly trying to obey God, and we slip up, and we disobey, and we sin and we fail, we know that grace is there to cover that sin. So instead of using it as an as a opportunity to pursue God, so very often what we'll do with the law of God is we'll say, well, here's the line. Here's the line. And instead of saying, well, I want to move as far away from that line as possible. Let me pursue God with everything that I have, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind. Instead, we'll go, so this is the line? This is the line right here? How close to the line can I get? Is it okay if just one foot touches the line as long as I have this other foot away from the line? Like, when is it truly sin? Can I step on the line? Do I, you know, is the line sin itself? Or do I have to cross the line in order to be sinning? And we'll, we'll ask silly, silly questions. And we'll say things like, you know, how far is too far? What's the definition of that? We'll get really Bill Clinton really quick. We'll try to redefine some words. And, and we'll try to justify ourselves in various different ways so that we can get just as close to sin as our sinful heart desires without crossing it over. Or to where if we do cross over, we can just say, oh, well, geez, I didn't know because I was doing blank. In youth ministry, we used to get this question all the time with couples that were dating. And they would say, well, you know, how far is too far before physically we're sinning? And I'd tell them, that's the wrong question. That's the wrong question. You know, what if, you know, Lindsay and I got, got married and, and after the, the ceremony, we go home and, and there, you know, she goes, I'm just so happy we're married. We're going to spend the rest of our lives together. And I go, yeah, but you know, what's the definition of adultery? She go, well, what? And I go, yeah, you know, like it really in, in your understanding, what would you call adultery? How far is too far before it's actually adultery? She goes, well, I don't understand. Well, so like, can I kiss another woman? Is that okay? Can I just text her dirty words? Is that okay? Uh, you know, can I, can I just, you know, uh, uh, browse her pictures online? Is that okay? Um, where is your thing? You know, is, is it just the act itself or is it the want to? I just want to know how far I can go without cheating on you. How many of you women would be happy with that conversation? None whatsoever. No, absolutely not. It's not how close to adultery can I get before it is adultery. It's how in love with you can I be? How devoted can I be? How far can I remove that questionable line whatsoever from my life to where even if somebody accused me of adultery, my life would go, <laughs> absolutely not. Not him. No, nah, because he, no, he doesn't do that. He doesn't tiptoe down that road. He doesn't even go close to the line. He pursues marriage. He pursues righteousness. He pursues fidelity. And so therefore, adultery is not even in the question. The same should be our relationship with every law that God gave us. That we pursue Him, we pursue His heart, we pursue being true to Him with such vigor and such passion that we're not even worried about crossing the line into sin. But how many of us, when God says no, we say, well, how close to the no can I get before I'm guilty? How close to the world, how in love with its things, how covetous, how thieving, how conniving, how lying, how deceiving, how wretched, how greedy can I possibly be before I step on that line? Instead of pursuing the blessing that is God, so often we try to tiptoe on that line. 
We can't say it's out of ignorance. It's just our heart. It's our want to. That's the problem. From verse 15 to the end of the chapter, Paul engages in this back and forth. And he's saying, you know, the things that I will to do, the things that I know are right, I just don't seem to be able to do those things. But man, you let something be no, you let something be a sin, and I got to watch myself around that sin continually. My, it seems like my flesh is just dragging me towards the line of sin, even though my mind and my consciousness, I want to pursue the things that are right and that are good and that are holy. I know what's right. I ascribe to what's right. I endorse what's right. I want to be perfect. I want to be holy. I want to be just like Jesus. But this old flesh wants every bit of sin that it can get. He's saying the Spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. He says, but I see another law in my members. He says, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. I know it. I love it. I see the wisdom in the things of God. But I see another law in my members, my body saying something else. And it says, it wars against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. See, before you were a Christian, you were spiritually dead. You were just like your father, Adam. You had died spiritually in your rebellion against God. And all that you had that guided you through this world was your own thoughts, your own desires, your own wants. If it feels good, do it. Follow your own arrow. Uh, be true to thine own self. All of that junk is what you carried with you as words of wisdom throughout your lost world. It was leading you right to the pit of hell. And then God intervened and God knocked upon your heart. God quickened you from that spiritual death and awakened you to the reality of him, to the reality of sin. And there we submitted to him and we gave him the honor and him the glory. We said, you are our Lord. You are our supreme authority. You are everything. He quickened you from the dead. Now what you are is a live spirit held hostage, held captive, imprisoned within that flesh. Within that flesh. Now, in prison, you don't get a whole lot of freedom. In prison, there's a lot of things that are predetermined for you. And then that, then you go here. When they say to go here, you're allowed this during this time. Here's your, here's your exercise time. Here's your outdoor time. Here's the shower time. Here's the meal time. Here's the watching TV time. Here's all of this is predetermined for you. And that you are within that realm of, of, of influence and that authority. But in that, while they may control times and they may control seasons, they don't control your mind. And you're still in charge of you. And so while we may be captive in this body, while we may be imprisoned within this flesh, our spirit man is still alive. And we have to make the decision on who's going to rule us. Is our spirit going to rule us? Or is our flesh going to rule us? Are we going to be spiritually alive or are we just simply going to give over into the things of this flesh, into the things of this world? For far too many, they give over. He says, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That's what your flesh is leading you towards. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Jesus Christ, even though that we are awakened spiritually, we are alive spiritually, we don't have to obey the things of this flesh. We can obey the Spirit. We can be led by the Spirit. We can obey God in our heart and in our soul, and it will manifest itself outward, and all of a sudden that old flesh, that old prison, begins to do things that it don't want to do. He says, so then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. 
Now, the chapter concludes here, but it's important that we don't just simply leave it here because if we just left it here, what would happen is people would walk out of the church house and get in the car to go home and they go, okay, well, it's okay for me to think the good things but do the bad things. Because after all, with the mind, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, I serve the law of sin. And so therefore, I can think the good things, do the bad things, and I'm being biblical. That's why there's chapter 8, and that's why there's chapter 9. That's not acceptable. That's not an excuse. Because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, because of the guidance of the Word of God, because of all of those things, there will be this struggle in us and in each and every one of us. And as we become more spiritually minded, as we become more given over to the things of the Spirit, the flesh has less and less and less of a draw on us. So there is never an excuse. There is never simply a passing over of the things of this flesh. There's never a giving in to the adult indulgences of the flesh and saying, well, you know, after all, I am just a man. I have man desires and, you know, it just, it just kind of happened. It's never an excuse. Never an excuse. So chapter 7 tells us that the law doesn't condemn us. The law does convict us of our sins, that it doesn't just simply leave us there because it does not deliver us up for judgment, but that we can fulfill the law and our obedience to God through the guiding of the Holy Spirit, that we can use the law in our lives to draw closer to God to be more humbled in our flesh, more alive in our spirit, that every day that we can use the law to become more and more like God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for loving us and for blessing us, Father. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your entire word. Father, we thank you for your law as it does reveal to us our own sinfulness. But Father, ultimately that it reveals your righteousness your perfection, your glorious state in which you are, Father. Father, that gives us a pattern that we can live by. It gives us things that we can avoid. It gives us goals that we can ascribe to. It gives us a moral code in which we can live. Father, we thank you for the gift that your law is. Lord, let us not pervert it. Let us not glorify it past your glory. But Father, let us use it wisely to be conformed to the image of Christ, to spread your light in this dark world, to be your ambassadors, your examples, to spread your kingdom, Father, right here on earth. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We adore you. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Won't you stand?